Okay. Um, welcome back again. So, um, my pleasure to introduce Andrew Hashka. He has been associated with the CCEM for many years and he's currently the tutorials co chair. Even though Andrew needs no introduction, let me go ahead and give you a brief of his background. He is the uh, impact technology practice lead for application modernization at uh, Google in Australia. Um, he leads the team responsible for delivering um, um, application vision with Kubernetes, Anthos, Apigee. Um, Andrew brings more than 18 years of experience in the in the software infrastructure and services industries. He has earlier played leadership roles in, in VMware, Downer, um, IBM, Thomson Reuters, and Optus. Uh, warm welcome to you, Andrew. Over to you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Let me share my screen. Can you see the screen now? Yes, we can. Fantastic. So, Andrew, um, maybe we could um, compress this into an hour and 15 minutes, if possible. We can do that. Let me set a timer so I can see. Maybe we can yeah. reserve 10 minutes for questions. So you have 60 minutes for the presentation and 10 for the question. That would be perfect. We can do that. Cool. So um, I'm going to cover off a number of different topics today, but typically they align to the conversations that I'm having with many organizations all across Asia Pacific. So I've noticed specifically uh, in my time working with customers and partners in India, there is a different breadth of um, maturity in terms of deploying new and modern workloads, but also maintaining more traditional workloads. So we're going to talk about the tools and the processes that these organizations need to go through in very large scale organizations or maybe even very small digital native consumer based organizations, what they need to go and start innovating. So just um, to set the scene as to where we're at and what I'm noticing, uh, especially around COVID times. Yeah, I would say that we've had many crises over um, the last hundred um, or so years, and there's been a new normal set in each of these occurrences. Now, after the Great Depression, there was a real focus on industrial restructuring. Um, after World War II, I guess there was this revolution around supply chain and the science for delivering product to consumers. After 9-11 in the US in 2001, there was a real focus around big security and ensuring that uh, security was paramount in all initiatives. And then um, after the Great Recession in uh, 2012, there was this real widening of the jobs uh, skills gap. So these were all new normals that we encountered uh, across uh, each of these crises. Now, if you think about COVID uh, in 2020, in the current state, we're seeing this uh, flow and adoption of changing from physically meeting each other to using virtual collaboration tools. But for businesses, there's this real refreshed focus on e-commerce. And how do we drive business all online now rather than through uh, physical means? Now, what can we expect uh, in the next one to two years off the back of COVID? I would say that deglobalization and localization and reshoring of uh, the way that we go and deliver our product uh, is definitely going to accelerate. We'll also see this um, increasingly transparent supply chain. So being able to uh, share product and services around an ecosystem with a diversified but local supply base. And there'll be a further widening of the skills gap. So that's what we're going to talk about here in terms of um, what are more traditional organizations having to do to move to this uh, level of innovation with their people? Now, top of mind for most organizations in this new normal, business continuity. How do we continue service, uh, I guess, uh, once uh, things go down? Maybe there's an environmental disaster. Maybe there's a power or a network outage. Maybe there's a, a political challenge which uh, prevents the service that we offer from happening in that particular location. 
and what can we do to continue that service uh, elsewhere. Now, the other aspect is around how do we optimize operations with the skill sets that we have? So how do we uh, aggregate the current manual processes that we look at and supplement that you know, with uh, maybe artificial intelligence, data analytics at scale, and maybe using software to orchestrate uh, a lot of the manual uh, platforms and applications that we need to maintain. And the third one is really around uh, where business strategy is driving. So openness, uh, open source, integration, uh, and being able to run the same portable, flexible application sets anywhere. We should be able to run it the same in the cloud as well as on premises across our hybrid cloud, also at the edge. And we should have access to those services like data analytics for harmonization standardization, regardless of where we sit to. So when we think about culture, site reliability engineering is typically uh, the culture within organizations that facilitates modern applications and innovations for the applications that take our services to our consumers. Now, there are a number of different things that uh, correlate through to delivering a strong uh, SRE-based culture. Um, and uh, I've, I've listed five of them here, and we'll step more through some of these things as we go through, but typically um, focusing on accepting failure as normal and moving fast and reducing organizational silos across the business, implementing gradual and small change, automating all of that change and change management and measuring everything. So these are keys as a starting point to identifying, look, how can we optimize what we do and do it more effectively, culturally? Now, if we think about um, how these solutions and these cultural changes will change how we do business uh, in large enterprises or even in small new startups, typically running the business, but monitoring uh, devices and inspecting uh, all of these services and managing remotely is going to be key. Predicting failures in any uh, equipment may be proactively, identifying when something is going to fail and having a methodology around, well, it doesn't matter if that component fails because we have redundancies in place. Having a, a focus on growing the business and building new customer solutions, improving that customer experience, maybe learning from artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, mechanisms to understand where is the gap in what we offer to our market? And how do we transform the business to empower our workers and our engineers to create new revenue streams with how they manage uh, their solution today? And how do we uh, collaborate securely from anywhere and go and deliver those services at scale to anywhere? So applications, if we think about applications and what they do, typically uh, their future is going to be defined um, by containerized microservices managed in a declarative way with a single control experience that uses a service mesh to span all locations. So we're gonna to touch on each of these points as we go through, but essentially this is uh, what we're trying to achieve. Now, before we go down that path, we're probably gonna understand why would you even consider modernizing applications? Well, I guess with the customers and, and consumers that I talk to, Typically, newly built applications are mainly only 5 or 10% of the applications that are running today. I would say uh, of all of the applications aggregated across India, maybe um, it's closer to uh, you know 10% based on the, the digital native innovation that we're seeing in the market. But there is still a very large volume of traditional and legacy applications. So by modernizing these applications and abstracting the application out, from those uh, very you know, monolithic structures that uh, we've defined historically, we get some things. We get speed and agility and security intrinsically built within the platform. We can avoid any, fo any form of proprietary vendor lock-in and empower open source, which has many more integration points is far more flexible, reliable uh, and portable. Now, in terms of uh, what we're doing for the applications themselves, we're typically moving away from those monolithic structures where everything is installed within the same uh, operating system, maybe as a, a tiered structure, which is, uh, I guess, typically quite complex to manage. And we're moving that to microservices. We're taking more traditional physical servers and virtual machines and abstracting those to containers and clouds. 
We're taking uh, waterfall manual software delivery approaches and moving to more DevOps, continuous integration, continuous deployment and development methodologies. And the last one there, we're moving away from proprietary uh, software, hardware, and we're empowering more open source. So I see this quite a lot. I'm working with a large organization in Indonesia and their first priority was we need to move away from all of the proprietary operating systems, applications and hardware that we have and move to open source so that we can grow and scale in the way that we need to, to go and deliver this new service to market. Now, if you think about um, the trends of the market, still there is a very large majority of workloads running on premises. You know, over 75% of workloads that I come across are still running on-prem and there is still a strategy for running a mixture of on-premises based workloads for security, compliance, governance, and also cloud-based workloads for speed and scale, and maybe cost reduction too. Now, typically around 60% of organizations want to modernize. They don't just want to pick up an application and move it with their operating system from A to B. They want to go and optimize and innovate as they go through. So what do we need to do as we're choosing to go and innovate? Typically, uh, for fast, modern application development and deployment, uh, we need to consider modernizing where we sit. Let's not try and boil the ocean and change everything in one go. Let's modernize in place. Let's set up a policy and security declaratively within a manifest so we can automate that and uh, define it at scale. And it also adds consistency. So if we uh, centralize our approach to how we uh, configure uh, and define what good looks like, then we can scale that anywhere. So a couple of um, different views on where new tooling and skill set is helping organizations to differentiate themselves. So simplifying management with a single control plane and consistency of controls. We notice organizations with a, a multi-cloud strategy or multiple physical data centers have a lot of silos to manage. Maybe they've got uh, multiple different vendors in the mix where it's really difficult to maintain teams to manage these, uh, these technology structures at scale. Now, I guess as we move more towards applications that we know will need to scale in today's economy, we need flexible deployment methodologies. We need portability of applications and we need the extensibility of services like analytics and AI and things that can maybe de be deployed from a marketplace to replace a lot of manual effort that we might typically spend in um, developing an application ourselves. So how do we progress organizational transformation? Think about culture uh, of a company and how they might choose to go and uh, deliver uh, software to date. It's very useful to start by measuring the company's performance. So let's uh, evaluate um, a breadth of team members, maybe over 50, and we can collect details around uh, how they currently operate to produce uh, software for the organization. We can benchmark those results against others. We can set prioritized uh, capabilities that might be large gaps, that might have a, a big reward if we go and change uh, the select few. We can choose to develop those specific capabilities based on best practices. And we can track progress in uh, maybe twice a year intervals. You know, being able to understand what has changed over that period of time allows us to then prioritize other capabilities that may help us accelerate in the future. So if we think about um, CICD or delivering software, this is typically what it looks like. If you choose to go and deliver software, maybe you're pulling down from a source repository, you're maybe automating some form of build or test methodology, you've got your centralized storage and your deployment methodology, and then your day two monitoring tool set. Now, I would say that this could be uh, very complex. And I met with a healthcare organization in Australia recently that said, well, you know, we've got a CICD, we've got loosely coupled open source tool sets, we've probably got about 40 of them. Now, if something goes wrong, how do we fix that effectively within our production grade SLAs? It's very difficult. We typically don't know which is the source of our problem. And if it's an open source tool set, uh, it's very difficult for us to go and get a, a fast response from an open source forum. So this is one of the methodologies that we see uh, around building uh, applications securely uh, with cloud native and modern apps frameworks in mind. 
So it's called the 12 factor application approach. And typically it's focused on everything from the code base to dependencies configuration, all the way through to parity between your development environments, production environments, logs, admin uh, processes, the end to end view on how you can offer the most effective portable uh, modern application in the market. And we've got a number of things that can tie in to how you might go and deliver this at scale. And we'll talk through those. So if we're thinking about 12 factor apps and we're thinking about the different personas that might uh, help us run an application set for an organization, typically the application owner is gonna be very interested in service automation. How do we go and deliver uh, automation of new features and releases uh, at scale? service management and DevOps cultures, and also traffic control. How can we direct traffic from our consumers to different application paths when we need to? Now, platform operators are typically very interested in automating the level of upgrade and patch management that they need to go through. They wanna use maybe the existing hardware that they're familiar with. They want consistency between the infrastructure they manage on-prem and also in the cloud. And they would like to implement some form of open API that's portable to any cloud so they can run the same scripts to any endpoint that they choose. Whereas security admins are very interested in security uh, intrinsically built uh, for the solution end-to-end -end by default. So how can we have our manifest of configuration uh, defined up front and go and scale it, deploy it anywhere, deploy it to any cluster? Now, once we've deployed that, how can we ensure that every microservice that we deliver has a secure encrypted uh, transmission by default. Maybe we encrypt it with MTLS and every microservice that talks to each other uh, is encrypted uh, with that traffic. Now, if we think about modernization, there are a couple of uh, challenges. Typically, many organizations I'm talking to might have a legacy uh, mainframe apps running with COBOL or an ERP system written in RPG or assembly, and many of them um, do not have the capabilities to go and rewrite those applications. Lift and shift of uh, some of those applications, in addition to more traditional virtual machines, typically doesn't address all of the operational needs and the business needs around moving quicker and really, uh, reducing cost. But most importantly, migration uh, is not a, a one or a zero. It's not uh, just a factor of um, taking your source and moving it to your destination. There are lots of different complexities around uh, dependency mapping, uh, portability, where the application can run, uh, and how our teams can manage those. So what does that look like? I guess um, if we're thinking about the paths to modernization, typically the endpoint for many organization uh, is a move towards cloud native apps, move towards containers and away from virtual machines, maybe uh, improve along the way, automate the migration approach with the virtual machine to maybe a Kubernetes uh, migration tool set uh, and improve the application and the way it's secured, the way it performs and its availability as we take it along that path. So what I'm seeing for a number of organizations to date, I'm not saying this is the only way to go forward, but typically looking at a migration path from traditional platforms to modern apps. So how do we do this? We, we typically need to go and identify the workloads. Are they virtual machines on-prem? Are they physical servers? Are they in other clouds? Um, next step, we might want to look to migrating to one platform that can run anywhere. Now, Kubernetes is one of those platforms. Uh, based off the back of uh, what Google created in our own data centers in 2003, um, where essentially you can run a self-healing um, auto repair distributed platform intrinsically secure across any cloud and on-prem. So uh, what we would typically recommend in moving to Kubernetes is that you auto containerize first, you generate some of those DevOps based artifacts for day two operations automatically with the tool set. And as a step three, you operate, manage, and optimize the application in a containerized architecture with a managed service mesh so you can scale the topology of all of those microservices with intrinsic security. Centralize your logging, monitoring, and enable some of those extensible services. Now, let's just take one uh, type of that as an example. I would typically say that Java is very topical for a lot of organizations right now because it's uh, prolific across pretty much every industry. 
you know, regardless of the industry, people are often running Java. Now, Java on uh, virtual machines can uh, incur quite a bit of cost. So a lot of organizations are looking to, well, how can we do Java more cost effectively? Now, moving Java's, uh, Java to containers and Kubernetes is typically uh, one very easy workload to move. Now, you've got a number of different approaches. You could take Java and move it as is. So you could lift the uh, legacy uh, application, move it into uh, containers, and you might get like a 37% TCO saving. But if you can automate testing and deployment and refactor the monolithic Java apps into microservices and maybe uh, improve the density, improve the efficiency and scale of the application, you're likely going to see figures of around 78% TCO settings. So let's think about the journey and what it takes to go and uh, get started with uh, some of these workloads. Typically, the end-to-end -end modernization journey starts with a discovery and an assessment view. So let's um, have some assessment tools to evaluate what we've got. Let's evaluate what we've got culturally. Let's evaluate what we've got in virtual machines and on clouds. Let's evaluate our maturity around APIs. And then when we set up the landing zone, we want to make sure that we're setting up uh, an architecture that has been well-defined, it's got security built in, it's been tested. You know, let's use a reference architecture or a Cloud Foundation toolkit to get started. And then as we start to identify workloads, let's um, use a migration-based tool set to move some uh, quick movers with a high level of value and low level of effort first. Um, let's choose to modernize where appropriate and lift and shift for the rest. And uh, lastly, around optimization, if we can apply a, a focus on creating a lot of those DevOps-based artifacts aligning to the SRE culture measures that I talked about earlier, then that's really going to help us accelerate into the future rather than just moving from one operating system to uh, another platform. So, what does this look like? The automated scanning uh, and deployment tool set is going to be key, but typically we also need to go and talk to individuals. We need to have surveys with the application owners, maybe some of the developers around how the application works, any requirements or prereqs or dependencies that maybe cannot be called out through an automated scan. We might wanna do some data analysis on both of those results and then produce a discovery report to which we can do a readback and get some buy-in from executives on you know, what might want to change first. How can we evaluate the biggest uh, impact to the organization based on what we've discovered? So um, there's an organization called DORA, DevOps uh, Research Assessment Organization. And they typically collect and research on culture across uh, all industries. Uh, I believe they've um, collected details and data around how organizations deliver software um, for many years now and to the volume of over 23,000 organizations. So typically, if you're going to go through and evaluate your culture, you might want to run uh, an assessment with Dora. Now, it's typically free to run. Uh, Google can help facilitate it too. But it's one of those things where you can identify, look, this is where we sit, maybe with the bar chart that you see in colors there. And the black uh, view is where the industry benchmark is. So you can see the big gap there between, say, performance and the industry benchmark or the lead time to deliver services or the mean time to restore um, to the industry benchmark. And then we can go one step further and start evaluating, well, what's actually going to help us move closer to that industry benchmark? And this chart typically shows us uh, a view on many different uh, sub-themes or capabilities that might align to cultural, technical, process, metrics, and monitoring. So in this chart, we can see that uh, we've got a bit of a gap there on loosely coupled architecture. We've got uh, a gap on continuous integration um, and uh, a number of other things where we could, uh, I guess, move quickly to go and uh, fix some of those gaps um, and uh, provide a very large impact to the organization. Now, I guess if we want to prioritize, we can also evaluate the bottom gray box there, which talks about uh, trunk-based development, monitoring, deployment, automation, security, uh, small batch cycles, continuous integration there um, uh, at the top of that gray box as uh, being very valuable for us to change first. And you could choose a mixture there. So you could choose a mixture of technical and blue, uh, maybe metrics and monitoring in yellow, 
and maybe process uh, in grain. Now, this organization seemingly has uh, a good level of strength around the cultural aspect, but that's not often the case that we see when we go and evaluate uh, where organizations are at today. So just to give you a breakout as to what low performance looks like compared to elites, typically if we go and break it into a simple category set, a deployment frequency um, where we can see the number of um, service uh, releases we can have uh, within a day uh, or within a week, a month, or every six months might indicate where we're at. So if we release um, multiple uh, services or releases uh, in a day, then we would be considered elite. If it takes us six months to go and deliver software to market, we could be considered low. Now, lead time for changes, how long does it take for us to go and implement a change? Is it less than one day or is it between one month and six months? I guess if we were less than one day, we would be considered elite as we would be if we had a failure and it took us less than one hour for us to restore that service. Now, the change failure rate, for every change that we go and implement, what percentage of those changes um, result in a failure? If we're between zero to 15% of those changes resulting in a failure, then we're considered elite. Whereas if we're over you know, 46%, then we're going to be considered a low performer culturally. Now, there is a very quick tool that uh, people could run that's free. You can go to this uh, website here, cloud.google.com slash DevOps, and you could take a quick check for an organization that you may have worked for or alongside and uh, see based on just five quick questions what that might look like. Now, it's easy to understand some of the best practices that are recommended off the back of this. This is just a quick check, though. So if you did want to go further and deeper to some of the other charts I showed, typically it's around 20 minutes of filling out a number of different questions, almost 100 questions, to go and produce the, the deeper dive analysis across individual teams and lines of businesses. And these are some of the best practices that have been documented. So I guess there are many here on the left-hand side that you can see where you may choose to focus just on version control or trunk-based development or cloud infrastructure. Now, these are the underpinning uh, categories and, and capabilities of delivering DevOps effectively across technology, process, measurement, and culture. And it's based on our own experience in delivering applications at scale across multiple uh, cloud locations. Now, if we think about uh, the other side of the house, yeah, we've just spoken about uh, elite DevOps performers and how culturally, we can go and deliver software uh, much more effectively um, if we go and uh, adopt a DevOps practice. What about the more traditional organizations that don't even know what they're running? I had a customer come to me uh, recently and say, look, we'd like to containerize, but we don't even know what applications we have. We don't know what virtual machines we have. We kind of know which ones are revenue generating, but we don't really know which might be good candidates for us to go and uh, innovate with. Well, we've got a, a tool that we acquired called Stratazone. It's a free tool. It'll allow you to go and discover all of the services that are running in uh, the environment. And it will give us good insights around certain things like dependency and utilization and the types of applications that are running that might be commercial off the shelf or custom built in-house. Now, to get started, very simple, go in and start the assessment to gather data within the collector maybe over a two-week period. Understand the peaks and troughs over different seasons and times and how that affects the uh, different applications. Typically stateless, very secure, all those things are of value to organizations. With an output that looks a little bit like this initially, it might give you an overall view of all the workloads you've collected. It might provide a comparison across different cloud platforms and a total cost of ownership figure. It will come in and it will help you evaluate uh, what you can do to maybe optimize some of those. If you were to go and take uh, that application on the operating system from where it sits today and move it somewhere more efficient, what does that efficiency look like? Has it been provisioned with 16 CPUs but only needs two? Or would it scale better if we had a scale-out architecture of multiple CPU-based um, workloads? Now, dependency mapping uh, is relatively key. I was working with an organization uh, in Thailand recently, and they decided to move their uh, web front end of their application to the cloud. 
because they wanted scale and their data center couldn't accommodate that level of scale. So they moved their web front end to a data center in Singapore, but their database was still residing in Bangkok, in Thailand. And they're wondering why the performance for this application was um, incredibly bad once they moved it. Now, obviously, the latency between the web front end and the back end database was now uh, very far apart, and the latency had uh, increased. So all very useful, I think, to understand before you make any change to an app, what else it's talking to. And you don't want to move or containerize an application without bringing along its dependent components as well for the journey. So when I speak to businesses and executives, typically they want to understand, look, modern apps, it's been a, a very strong theme in our strategy for a while, but it's been difficult to qualify why we should do it as a business. You know, labor is one of those things that's rather subjective around benefits, you know, especially across Southeast Asia, India, parts of North Asia as well. So uh, what are the, the true uh, aspects that we can build into our business case that will show how we're going to add some value? Now, typically license cost savings, the amount of cost that you might save in refactoring an application from a virtual machine to a container, uh, in moving away from uh, more manual approaches to CICD and elevating business agility, what do we have there? And then the meantime to restore a service. If the service goes down, how much money are we losing? for the duration of time that that service is going down. So this is a, a very quick and easy uh, total cost of ownership view with return on investment figures that help us to map it out for businesses. So I would say that before we uh, embark on any level of change, we need executive buy-in. And this is a great view just on one page to go and evaluate, well, what is the level of change and value that we will see in this activity? Now, I guess once we've done that, we need to identify some workloads that we're going to move first. These are typically um, high business value. They're not mission critical. They've got few dependencies. They don't have a large volume of data um, and they don't have complex third party licensing uh, arrangements. And typically they can have a, a cutover window that works within the schedules of the people doing the migration. We like to map out different waves of migrations as well. So those having high business value and low levels of effort to implement, or you know, maybe finishing with the ones that have very low business value, but high levels of effort to go and implement. So start with the high business value first and then move to the low business value at the end. Now, if you think about uh, applications, we like to prioritize based on complexity. And uh, we like to categorize uh, based on what we know about the application uh, and its use. So we might choose to work, create a flowchart where we could build out the age of the application as an example, uh, whether there's uh, buy-in to move, is it a strategic application, does it have third-party software or was it crafted in-house, um, and in terms of complexity, how many moving parts does it have? And then we can kind of build out this view on what makes the most amount of sense for the workloads that mean the most to the business. Now, when we talk about building a migration factory, typically it's around repeatable processes. So we build that target environment, we migrate the workloads that we've prioritized, we automate uh, and validate testing, we maybe uh, optimize some of those workloads. And I'll talk more about uh, decoupling uh, and potentially strangling the monolith uh, as an industry term to go and evacuate monolithic architectures to microservices too. That's more on the optimized piece there. And then I guess before we move to the next round of migrations, we need to learn from what didn't work so well and what we can change in the future. So this is what it looks like, I guess, um, in a view. We've talked a, a little bit about the refactoring, um, maybe a little bit about uh, optimization. There's also that view down below, uh, which is replace. In many cases, organizations might choose to use a new commercial off-the-shelf app um, and uh, replace an existing application that might be too complex to refactor. But having that view on change factory, optimize and change beyond just lift and shift is going to be key to innovation. So this is a very long list of things that I won't step through individually, but I found it typically works as a very good checklist for organizations that are looking to invoke some level of change and move away from monolithic applications to microservices. They might start with a cost benchmark to a performance benchmark so they know what they're measuring against. 
They'll centralize their logging and monitoring. They'll do version control. They'll have a focus on API-based microservices. They'll map organizational roles to new functions, and they'll provide self-service. Now, I haven't covered all of those, but typically uh, all of these are definitely recommended uh, as an approach to go and move uh, from a more traditional outset to something uh, more innovative and manageable at scale. Now, in terms of the actual um, mapping of a, a monolith to a microservices-based architecture itself, uh, I've got a phased view here on what we actually do to the app. You know, I was talking to you on the previous slide about the process and all of the different components we might want to consider. But the actual application itself, if we start with the current state of a monolithic application, everything installed in one bucket, I guess you could uh, take an example of that. Um, what are some quick wins that we could look at? Maybe we just move out some of those static assets like uh, images to uh, a third party uh, repository. You know, maybe as a, a second step, we focus on building the foundation through a, a UI for a web browser or mobile app with APIs. The next one, we might uh, look at having a, an adoption or a change to the presentation layer, followed by browse and search, and then uh, personalization and customization for session. And then finally, we can decompose that monolith. Now, a lot of this might need to be manually driven. There are parts in the previous slide that are definitely automated. Now, we can abstract out the application and move it to a container and Kubernetes with an automated tool set. Taking out static assets and building in APIs and presentation, browse and search, these are some things that might need to be done manually. But we do have some good uh, best practice uh, guidance on how we could do that uh, and maybe provide some fast track approaches to doing it effectively uh, without having to do so much rework. So um, at the outset, this is what your monolith might look like, phase one. And then if we fast track all the way through to uh, the decommissioning phase, this is where we're breaking out each of those services into a different component with a breakout there to the storage layer, presentation layer, caching layer, API management gateway, all the way through to where your customers are consuming it. So essentially uh, reducing that complexity uh, and decommissioning what uh, might be more traditionally difficult to manage. Now let's think about how we do this uh, and think about you know, where I come from um, in this perspective. You know, I um, look after modern applications uh, at Google for Asia Pacific. Now, modern applications is not something very new to Google. You know, we've been delivering modern applications with the birth of our own Borg platform in 2003. Now, that has scaled to uh, releasing Kubernetes in the market in 2015, and all of the uh, services that correlate through to a modern applications platform up to uh, now, 2020, where we've uh, released uh, Tekton for automated build, uh, beyond serverless with Cloud Run, Istio as a service mesh, and many other things that you see here. But a very long history uh, of uh, bringing this modern applications platform uh, internally to scale and then to market um, where consumers could leverage it. So this is definitely not something new. I would say, though, that um, the approach nowadays uh, looks a little bit different for consumers because they're often in many different positions. Maybe they want to start with the analysis of their API maturity or maybe evaluating their uh, culture with Dora, evaluating some of their uh, traditional workloads with Stratazone. But off the back of that, they've probably got two different approaches. Are we building new or are we migrating older apps? And I would say for those migrating older apps, we've got a number of um, focus areas where we can automate some things. So uh, whether we're abstracting that application out of the virtual machine and moving it to a container in Kubernetes with Migrate for Anthos, or whether we're taking that legacy COBOL code and moving it to a modern language, like Java, perhaps, or something else. Um, that is generally part of the approach that will then end up landing on the runtime. So it could be serverless with Cloud Run, could be uh, Kubernetes Engine, which we've got they're under run as well. Day two operations uh, and management tools with observability and declarative config management, all of which is facilitated under our banner uh, of Anthos there. But I guess it's reasonably critical to know that these are tools at the end of the day. This is um, how you go and implement 
modern applications according to Google and what we uh, would tend to use internally to go and facilitate our level of scale. Now, I guess um, having a, a view as to where this runs, you know, we see this running not only on Google Cloud. It runs on premises on top of uh, vSphere platforms, but also we'll see running on top of bare metal and edge very soon. Uh, I believe um, you know this year is something that uh, you know many of our customers are quite excited about. In addition to managing things like um, Microsoft Azure AKS, their Kubernetes engine, or Amazon uh, EKS, their Kubernetes engine, or being able to deploy our entire stack inclusive of Kubernetes on top of Amazon EC2 with a preview for Azure as well. So when we think about modern apps, typically it's a combination of Anthos and Apogee together. And it's not just around running Kubernetes. You know, container management is just one piece there, but you've got to consider operations management, service management layer, policy management, development, and that migration tool set with the API gateway to have a complete view. So in many cases, a lot of these different components are broken out in solutions across the market. Uh, and I would say that in order for us to be most effective, it makes sense to roll all of those in into one um, intrinsic uh, and integrated platform. So whether it's a modern application, a legacy VM-based application, a marketplace application, we should be able to manage all of those centrally with one single pane of glass view and deploy it to any cloud we choose and also to any platform that may run in our data centers today. So we've got a number of reference architectures that are shared publicly around uh, how we may choose to run Anthos and Apogee together on top of an HPE or a Cisco or a Dell or an Intel or a Lenovo piece of hardware. Uh, and this really makes it very portable and flexible uh, for any type of arrangement that a customer may choose to run uh, on-prem. So flexibility, I think, is one of the main points there. Now, just to step in uh, very briefly to each of the areas around how the tool sets are accelerating growth within organizations, multi-cloud and multi-cluster management through the one single pane of glass view uh, and automating a number of things within the graphical user interface uh, is key. And also simplifying the approach because a lot of uh, more traditional organizations don't have a very strong CLI skill set right now. And a lot of Kubernetes and open source technologies are driven towards command line interface. So a lot of typing that maybe they're not too familiar with the command set. So we make it easy and consumable with the UI that essentially allows you to manage all of it uh, at scale uh, in the same way, but without having to learn a whole bunch of new things. Similarly, from a centralized logging and monitoring perspective, if you're running an application across multiple clouds, typically uh, you don't want to have to manage uh, an application uh, differently if it runs on one cloud versus another or on-prem versus the cloud. So centralizing monitoring across uh, all of your clouds and locations is going to be key. And deploying a, a Kubernetes engine that I guess has been around for a very long time. Now, I guess we invented Kubernetes uh, at Google and we contribute most to it in its open source sense. But beyond the uh, capabilities that many customers choose to adopt Kubernetes for in the market, like auto repair and upgrade and scaling, having that financially backed SLA, service level agreement, to go and deliver uh, what your application needs is going to be key. Now, service mesh we've talked about briefly, but visualizing how each of your microservices talk to each other really makes it easy to manage. And we've got a topology view that I guess could be compared over two different periods of time. We could set service level objectives based on service level indicators to help you uh, achieve whatever uh, service you might want to release to your consumers. Now, if you're uh, unable to set a service level objective for your service, then you don't know whether you're achieving uh, your consumer expectation. So what we recommend typically is let's drive uh, some of these SLAs based on what we want our consumers to feel uh, from our product. Now, binary authorization is typically uh, in our data centers driven from the ground up, you know, from the physical machine with uh, your own Titan security chip all the way through compute and Kubernetes engine. Uh, but now we're also seeing that a lot of organizations building new software uh, prefer to run software that has been uh, trusted and validated by their organization. So I guess 
Binary authorization is one of those capabilities where we can attest that the container image and the software that we run, and the application code that we run, has been tested and validated and vetted by our organization. And this ensures that we're running software uh, that is uh, truly meant to run uh, in production for our consumers, and there's no risk there. Now, configuration management, there was a very large bank that I was working with in Australia recently, uh, and they said, look, we've got uh, many Kubernetes clusters running uh, our modern applications at scale. One of the biggest challenges that we wanted to solve was how do we manage the configuration, compliance, security that we need to as a leading financial organization? Now, for them, Anthos Config Management allowed them to create one manifest stored in a, a central repository, plugged into their uh, CI/CD methodologies, but also declaratively push out that policy to any of the workloads that they were managing and potentially prevent any change from happening. Now, if they chose to allow a change, uh, they could instantly revert within a couple of seconds back to uh, what had been originally defined. Now, their security uh, professionals loved that because it meant that they didn't need to worry about manual uh, security risk anymore and change of any uh, security-related feature for their applications uh, based on this declarative approach. So one thing that I'm also noticing is this real push towards low-code, no-code, no empowering developers, being able to allow developers to start building and running software in a way that um, they would not have an obstacle of requesting infrastructure from their infrastructure admin. Now, I would say um, Cloud Run, based on Knative, our serverless platform, um, based on open source Knative, is essentially this approach where you can scale down to zero, you can build uh, from a container image to production in seconds. Um, it supports all Docker images and it's based on, uh, I guess, open source, so it's fully integrated and flexible, portable, um, and essentially production supported, which is what a lot of organizations want. Uh, they're not wanting to manage the infrastructure as much right now, uh, especially during COVID where number of skills uh, that they've got available to build new apps might be limited. So they want to reduce uh, the amount of time and the obstacle it takes to go and take those apps to market. So serverless platforms like Cloud Run really help to facilitate that. Uh, and then I guess the broader CI/CD continuous integration deployment methodology, if we can centralize all of those loosely coupled open source tool sets that I spoke about in the previous slide around delivering CI/CD and have it on one platform, have one CI/CD approach where you can run that across multiple clouds on-prem deploy to multiple runtimes, whether it's serverless, whether it's Kubernetes engine or something else, uh, but have it fully production supported for enterprise grade scale, then that is going to simplify the approach as well. But I would say as a tool set and a capability to learn uh, as an individual and a consumer or uh, someone within an organization that would really like to, to change and adapt, CICD is one of those things that is really scaling in the market and is really helping organizations to uh, accelerate. So anyone with CICD skills uh, is typically very well regarded uh, in this market. Now, in terms of uh, another skill that is typically uh, in high demand, uh, being proficient in APIs. So ensuring that your infrastructure on the right-hand side there connects to your consumers, and that could be a more traditional consumer with uh, web front end, uh, buying from a, an online shop, a uh, mobile front end, IoT device, or an assistant. Now you need to bridge from those consumer devices and endpoints to the applications that you've built on your hybrid infrastructure with uh, typically APIs. So centralizing your APIs through analytics and a developer portal and intrinsic security and extensions to many other services is really going to help generate new revenue streams. Now, one of the other things that is uh, really scaling in the market that I'm seeing is this focus on security. Organizations are increasingly spending a lot more time mitigating the security risk um, than uh, potentially some other initiatives that uh, they could focus on. So the more security minded we are in the way that we can offer value without constraint around uh, enhancing security is going to be key. 
Now, uh, security enhancements come in multiple different flavors. There could be the infrastructure and workload view, to which you see we've got a number of different things, all the way from binary authorization that we talked about, through to uh, disk encryption and many more. Networking, application, identity, policy, and configuration management are also other categories. And typically what uh, I feel is very well regarded is an evaluation of all of these uh, security uh, benefits and capabilities that we could offer uh, in the market and identifying which are some of the key wins or, or quick wins that we could go and change uh, to add a lot of value uh, without uh, a big impact to the way that the organization currently works. And then incrementally we can grow uh, into adopting the entire view of a very uh, secure environment end to end from infrastructure through to policy management. Now, I guess um, one of the, the biggest things that we're seeing right now is, well, let's try and move automatically from A to B. And I talked about an automated tool set to go and move from virtual machines to containers. And that's typically one of the first steps of modernization. You know, moving from VMs to a Kubernetes engine uh, with Anthos potentially uh, is uh, a very easy approach. There's an automated tool set we have called Migrate for Anthos. Uh, which will typically uh, abstract that application out, create the Docker files and the YAML manifest, the uh, DevOps artifacts that you need to go uh, and run your modern application. Uh, and having a, a capability in this level of migration of an application um, is uh, being very highly regarded uh, in many of the markets that I'm talking to at the moment too. Being able to move away from the manual approach of having someone uh, basically refactor and reinstall and recode an application for a container and being able to do it with an automated approach in software uh, is something that will be very valuable uh, as a tool, I feel, in 2021. Now, on the other side to that, beyond just the infrastructure, you know, if we consider some of the older languages that might be out there, um, you know, eTrieve and JCL and Ideal, COBOL, etc., there are very few people that have skill sets these days in writing and maintaining those languages. So what we are often seeing is organizations want to take the approach where they go and uh, move to a modern language. So we would say being able to uh, automatically discover that legacy language, uh, assess it, identify what it can move to, and then do the full uh, legacy application conversion and move uh, to that modern language, maybe like Java, with full automated testing and performance tuning is very critical. So there's a tool as well called uh, G4 that basically facilitates that discovery uh, and migration, uh, and definitely one uh, that would be uh, valuable to learn uh, if you're interested in the modernization approach. So um, just to uh, close out, I guess some of the things that we're seeing from business perspective, um, increase platform operations efficiency by over 55%, get over a five times return on investment in containerization. Um, these are things that are really going to benefit every role. And I would say if you're looking to work in a developer space or platform engineering, there are a number of things that uh, you could maybe focus on. So for developers, CI, CD and build pipelines, maybe serverless. For platform engineering, maybe migration tools and centralized management like Anthos. For service operators, maybe simplicity of deployment, but also rollback to get that mean time to restore figure down. Uh, and then security and compliance, making sure that you've got the ability to do it centrally and declaratively with a configuration management tool. So in terms of getting started, um, I would say any form of evaluation of the current state, you, know, you could help to run it within the organization you work for, you could promote it to someone that you're working with or, or friends with that knows um, that they need to uh, start modernizing. You know, evaluating uh, the legacy virtual machines, the culture, the API maturity are typically good starts. And I would say that evaluating the total cost of ownership and return on investment from a business perspective is also a, a very good asset to have. Now there's a Forrester's TEI report uh, that will talk about a number of different things that uh, you can gain from containerization, uh, and many more product deep dives in the links below it. Now, a couple of uh, third-party articles out there which have been co-written um, with Google best practices in mind, the O'Reilly set are typically um, 
some good starting points. So building secure and reliable systems and the site reliability workbook uh, are some of my favorites there. So that's come to the end uh, of my session. I think we're uh, almost at the hour mark, but I wanted to leave some time for uh, questions and uh, maybe any follow-up that people needed. Yes, Dr. Mohan had a question. I'll bring... Sure. What was the question? Yeah. Good morning, uh, Andrew. Hello. Uh, wonderful talk. Really appreciate the variety of tools that you have brought up to our uh, uh, attention as to how Google Cloud. Oh, is can't hear very well. Are you able to hear you? Hear me? Hello? Uh, you're breaking up a bit there. Um, Are you able to hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. That's, okay. That's okay. So it's a very wonderful talk, Andrew. While uh, many of the tools you touched upon are all enterprise level, uh, I'm just curious as to what Google Cloud provides for small and medium businesses to migrate into the Google Cloud. I'm talking about the SMEs. Yeah, look, I, I would say that um, a platform like Kubernetes and leveraging Kubernetes engine doesn't have to be enterprise scale. Okay. Uh, I'm noticing a number of startups that are starting with very small volumes uh, have chosen Kubernetes as their platform of choice. Okay. Uh, I would say serverless is probably one of the easiest places to start um, because it can start at zero. You can build okay. an application and uh, scale based on the volume of consumers that you have. Um, so things like that, I feel, are uh, typically very good starting points. We also have a, a no-code solution called AppSheet. Now, AppSheet basically allows you to pull in all of the data sources and dependencies, build your application through essentially point and click and publish it instantly. So things okay. like that uh, are typically going to be good for anyone um, not working in the enterprise space, but would like to leverage tools that are also used in enterprise organizations. And the reason why I think that's valuable is because uh, as we all kind of evolve in our careers, being able to have the skill set and use of tools um, that are relevant in the enterprise segment um, uh, are generally very well regarded. OK. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, another question which I would like to ask you is, as a small business uh, spanning several continents, we come across this problem of having to comply with the European data protection and privacy regulation, GDPR. And uh, when we run it on the cloud, we haven't much uh, uh, insight or the visibility into how all of that operates, say, on the Google Cloud. What kind of support do you also give for uh, small businesses? I'm not talking about enterprise level, because anything just enterprise level has all the gamut of tools available for them. For small guys, how do we survive? Yeah, look, I guess one of the benefits of Google Cloud uh, is that we have consistency, especially from a compliance standpoint. If you run a small workload or a workload of enterprise scale, on top of Google Cloud, you still get the benefits of the compliance validation uh, that we've been through. And we've got a, a number of uh, compliance certifications listed uh, on the public site. Um, I can share the, uh, the link to um, where those compliance uh, frameworks are located and what we've documented there once I stop screen sharing. But um, I would say, if you can deploy in a platform, where you don't manually need to configure something to be compliant to a particular industry. Like I notice um, in financial sector, there's a, a focus on payment card industry. In Korea, there's a strong focus on common criteria certification. Uh, in Australian government, maybe there's IRAP. You know, all of these compliance frameworks can be very complex if you're starting from a platform that is not already compliant. So being able to go through and um, just start using the, the cloud platform because you know that it was built with compliance in mind um, is uh, typically going to make it very consumable 
for small uh, and corporate businesses. Um, so let me share the link to that. Um, yeah, sure, sure. Good sharing. sure, Andrew, thank you so much. Oh, um, thanks, uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, perhaps we can open this up for questions. Maybe I'll start with one question that I have, if I may, Andrew. Sure. Okay, so um, with um, technology level transformation, like you mentioned, you won't get the benefits unless there is an organizational level transformation as well. Um, so, so um, for example, there was one customer where one business unit experimented with automation, but since all of these technologies were being tried out by different departments, there was no cost benefit at the at the wider level. Um, so um, unless there is a, a push by C-level executives and town hall talks to the troops and such, uh, there won't be um, a central level uh, benefit readiness analysis and, and migration planning and, 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 and such. Right? You mentioned the example of, of a Thailand deal where the DB tire ended up on-prem while the web tier move to Google Cloud in Singapore and which is perhaps the result of a central centralized governance or or an overall org level buy-in. So my question is um, with Google Cloud and Pass, you are at the very center of all of this. Uh, you also mentioned an organization uh, having COBOL code uh, that wants to modernize and and the, and the unique challenges they face, right? So uh, very interested to learn what you're seeing from the perspective of org transformation that has to support the tech transformation around application modernization. Yeah. Um, so I recently ran a, a cultural assessment with a very large bank uh, in Southeast Asia and another one in Australia. And we're going through with um, a more digital native organization actually in India right now. Um, now, I would say uh, they're quite uh, different as organizations, yes, two are in financial services, one is more of a digital native, um, but culturally, um, they still have some of the same problems. Um, so when you talk about uh, innovation in small pockets within organization, that's what we've found in some cases where you might have one team that is the digital arm of that organization. They deliver everything in containers, but maybe that's only 5% of the workloads that that organization runs. So I found that when we evaluate culture, we need to be able to evaluate by individual team. So one of the caveats that I found is that uh, the first organization that we did this for decided, well, we'll just get an aggregate across the entire company. And they got uh, 50 or maybe 60 responses to uh, this survey uh, evaluating their cultural readiness. Um, and uh, they had maybe seven, eight different teams that all responded. So when we aggregated the results, it appeared like um, generally, you know, they were fine. They were averaged out between the high achievers uh, and the low achievers within the organization. So they just basically came to uh, a, a median uh, rating. So I'd say that because different teams and lines of businesses are often uniquely different in a corporate sense, in an enterprise sense, even uh, in some startups, they've got different pockets uh, of different ways of working. It's important that we culturally evaluate uh, individual teams uh, and we can go deep on individual teams and then we can bring all teams up to the same level. Now, some teams have a very long way to go in terms of DevOps, whereas some teams maybe have delivered DevOps, but they're having challenges at delivering security, production support uh, and scale. So uh, I guess the recommendation is that we go through and we uh, work with individual teams rather than the overall organization. Um, we also assess the end-to-end -end landscape of all of the workloads that this organization has to run. Um, and I would say that having the holistic view means that we're not leaving any workload behind. So incredibly critical as um, some organizations define strategies, which tend to be quite generic around, well, we're looking for multi-cloud or we're looking for uh, this type of uh, analytics or AI or maybe just containerization, we need to bring them all together. Otherwise, they're going to be disaggregated. Uh, and from an organizational standpoint, we might have 
limitations around the overall benefit that we have to the consumer services. All right. Um, I think um, Krishnan, your host for the session, is uh, unable to get the connection through properly. So on his behalf, and on behalf of all of IEEE CCEM, uh, looks like Krishnan is back. Krishnan, please do the honor. No <laughs> it's been froze. So. Okay. So, so any any other questions for the team or we done? There are no more questions. Um, I just messaged to the attendees. Okay. There are no questions. Okay. Okay. So thanks, uh, Andrew. Outstanding session. Superb. Very very informative. And that too, you you are wearing your client hat and and gathering pain points from your client experiences. So very insightful and and, and grounded uh, tutorial. I'm sure the the entire team enjoyed it. Thank you very much. So with this, we will perhaps uh, end today's morning session. Uh, we'll meet again 5.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time, 7 a.m. Uh, EST in the U.S. time. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, we'll... Thanks Krishna. Fantastic. Thanks. Thank you so much. I look forward to uh, working with you all again very soon. And please, if anyone has any other questions, reach out to me on Twitter. More than happy to... Um, Help with individual questions. Why not Gmail, Andrew? Hey, look, you could uh, send me a, a Gmail too. You could send it to my Google address as well. I find uh, that um, for some of the, the short responses, we're uh, getting a lot of interest out of uh, India and Southeast Asia with Twitter. Now, I'm not tied uh, either way. I would say many different ways to communicate. Okay, I'm sorry. What's your Twitter handle, Andrew? Uh, Andrew Hashka. I ask. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks All again, right. and, and thanks to the audience for coming. Have Thank a great day, and see you in the evening. Absolutely. Chat to you soon. Bye bye. Thank you, Anil. Bye.